Here we'll introduce implicit differentiation. It's a great tool for finding the derivatives of a few messy functions, and it pretty much amounts to taking the derivative of both sides of an equation. Let's start things off with a familiar derivative. What's the derivative of x to the nth power, where n is an integer, meaning it's a positive or negative whole number? Right. The derivative of x to the nth power is n times x to the n minus 1. And as we said, this is the rule for derivatives of powers when the power is an integer. Now let's look at non-integer powers, like the function y equals x to the 1 half power. x to the 1 half is the same thing as the square root of x, so let's write it like that. For implicit differentiation, we'll want to rewrite this equation in terms of functions we can already find the derivative of. What's an equivalent way to write this equation? Try squaring both sides of the equation. Exactly. Saying y equals the square root of x is the same thing as saying that y squared equals x. Now here's where we'll use implicit differentiation. Let's take the derivative of both sides. We'll take the derivative with respect to x, so that's d over dx on both sides. First, let's look at the left side of this equation. What's the derivative with respect to x of y squared? You'll need the chain rule to figure this out. It's difficult to take the derivative with respect to x of this because there's a y here. To use the chain rule, we can try to rewrite it as the derivative with respect to y of y squared, but then we need a chain rule piece, dy dx. The dy's would basically cancel out and leave you with the derivative with respect to x, which is what you want. Nicely done. To find the derivative of y squared with respect to x, we've used the chain rule. First, the derivative of something squared is 2 times that something. So we have 2y. And then we want to multiply the 2y by the derivative of y, which is dy dx. And so the left side of the equation equals 2y times dy dx. Now try evaluating the right side of this equation. Right, the derivative of x with respect to x is 1. So when y equals the square root of x, 2y times dy dx equals 1. Try solving this equation for dy dx, which is the derivative of the square root of x. If you divide both sides of this equation by 2y, you find that dy dx, the derivative, is equal to 1 over 2y. Now we don't want to write the derivative in terms of y. You'll notice that all the answers have x's on the right side. So we have to substitute the value of y in terms of x. Do that, and you should be able to figure out the answer. Right. You can solve for dy dx by first dividing both sides by 2y. In this example, y is defined as being equal to the square root of x. So we can plug the square root of x in for the y down here. And that gives us dy dx equals 1 over 2 times the square root of x. What's an equivalent way to write this result down here? Remember that whenever you have the square root of x, you can write that as x to the 1 half power. So that means this derivative is equal to 1 half times 1 over x to the 1 half. Try rewriting 1 over x to the 1 half with an x in the numerator, and you should be able to find the answer. Exactly right. This expression is the same as 1 half times x to the minus 1 half power. 
So you found that the derivative of the square root of x equals 1 half times x to the minus 1 half. And you said earlier that the square root of x is the same thing as x to the 1 half power. So the derivative of x to the 1 half equals 1 half times x to the minus 1 half. And you might notice that this equation matches the one up here, in the case when the power n equals a half. If you look at this exponent over here, it's n minus 1. When n equals a half, this exponent should be a half minus 1, or minus a half, just as it is down here. It turns out that this power rule for derivatives doesn't just work for integer values of n. It works for any value of n, like a half, or minus 17.2, or pi. Great. So we've used implicit differentiation, meaning taking the derivative of both sides of a rearranged equation, to find the derivative of the square root of x. You can also use implicit differentiation to find the derivatives of other functions, like logarithms and inverse trig functions, as you'll see later. Here you'll work out the derivatives of logarithmic functions. The first logarithmic function we'll look at is the natural log, which is the same thing as the log in base e. But before we work out exactly what the derivative of the natural log is, let's see if we can figure out what the derivative looks like. Here's a graph of y equals the natural log of x. And now here are three more graphs. Which of these, a, b, or c, is a graph of the derivative of the natural log? The derivative of a graph is just the slope of all the tangent lines. Notice that every tangent line for this graph has a positive slope. Which answer choice is a function that's always positive? Right, a is the derivative. If you look at the graph of the natural log, the instantaneous slope is always positive, but it's decreasing. So this is the graph of the derivative. Now let's figure out exactly what the derivative of the natural log is. First off, what's an equivalent way to write this statement, that y equals the natural log of x? Remember that whenever you have a logarithmic equation, like y is equal to the log base b of x, you can always rewrite it using exponents, b to the y is equal to x. Remember that the natural logarithm is another way of writing the logarithm base e of x. So using this and this rule, can you figure out another way to write this expression? Right. Saying that y equals the natural log of x is the same thing as saying that x equals e to the y power. Now let's use implicit differentiation will take the derivative of both sides of this equation. What's the resulting equation you get? The derivative of x is just 1. You know how to find that. But what's the derivative with respect to x of e to the y? Well, we know how to take the derivative with respect to y of e to the y. But in order to get an x in the denominator, we have to multiply by a chain rule piece. So we're going to multiply it by dy dx. Which answer choice looks like this? Exactly. The derivative of x is 1. And to find the derivative of e to the y, we can use the chain rule. Let's first take the derivative of e to a power, which is e to that same power, or e to the y. And now we can multiply this result by the derivative of the power. So we're multiplying e to the y by the derivative of y. And we can write the derivative of y as dy dx. So from implicit differentiation of this equation, you found that 1 equals e to the y times dy dx. dy dx is the derivative of y. And we said y is the same thing as the natural log of x. So try using this equation to find dy dx, which is the same thing as the derivative of the natural log. The 
the derivative of ln of x is the derivative of y. What's dy dx? Well, dy dx we can get by solving this equation here. It's just 1 divided by e to the y. Now we want this side to be in terms of x. All the answer choices have x's in them and no y's. To turn that e to the y into an x, you can use this equation. Give it a shot. Right, let's see how you got that. You solved for dy dx by dividing both sides of this equation by e to the y. And earlier, you found that e to the y equals x. So you replaced the e to the y down here with an x. And so therefore, dy dx equals 1 over x. To summarize, if y equals the natural log of x, then dy dx equals 1 over x. In other words, the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. Here's the graph of the natural log again, and here's the graph you picked to be its derivative. Sure enough, this graph is 1 over x, which we've found is the derivative of the natural log. Next, let's find the derivative of the log of x in a base b. For natural logs, the base is e, but now we'll look at functions with any base. First off, what are equivalent ways to write this expression? Let's suppose this was y, then another way to rewrite that equation is that b to the y is equal to x. Now what happens if we take the natural log of both sides? Well, then we get that the ln of b to the y is equal to the natural log of x. And you know that if you have the natural log of something raised to a power, you can just pull the power in front. So you have y times the natural log of b is equal to the natural log of x. So another way to write that is that y is equal to the natural log of x divided by the natural log of b, which corresponds to one of the answer choices. There's one more answer choice that's equal to this expression here. Can you figure it out? Right, you can use the change of base logarithm identity, and one of the ways to rewrite this expression is the natural log of x over the natural log of b. Taking the derivative of both sides of this equation, we see that the derivative of the log of x base b equals the derivative of this fraction. Can you simplify this expression to find the derivative of the log of x base b? In this expression, 1 over ln of b is just a constant. It doesn't depend on x. So the derivative of the log base b of x can be written as the derivative of 1 over the ln of b times the ln of x. This is a constant so we can pull it in front of the derivative, and then we're left with 1 over the ln of b times the derivative of the ln of x. You know what the derivative of ln of x is, so you can plug that in to get the answer. Nicely done. You saw that the natural log of b in the denominator is a constant, so you can pull it out of the derivative. And that leaves the natural log of x inside the derivative. Earlier, you found that the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. So let's substitute 1 over x for this derivative down here. So the derivative of the log of x base b equals 1 over x times 1 over the natural log of b. Since we're multiplying these fractions together, we can combine them by multiplying their numerators and denominators. So that's 1 over x times the natural log of b. And there you have it. You found that the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x, and the derivative of the log of x in any base b equals 1 over x times the natural log of b. 
Now try using these facts to find the derivative of this function, the natural log of x to the x. This one is pretty tricky. As a first step, try using a log identity to simplify this expression inside the derivative. Good luck! If you try to use the chain rule here, you'll have to eventually take the derivative of x to the x, which is hard, so let's not do that. Instead, use the fact that ln of x to the x is equal to x times the ln of x. Now you have the product of two functions that you know how to take the derivative of. We'll call this f and g. And remember, if you're taking the derivative of f times g, it's f times the derivative of g plus g times the derivative of f. Why don't you try using the product rule to see if you can get the answer? In this tutorial, we'll find the derivatives of inverse trig functions. But first, do you remember what the derivative of the sine of x is? Exactly. If y equals the sine of x, then the derivative of y, or y prime, equals cosine x. Great. So after that warm-up, let's turn our attention from the sine function to the inverse sine function. Here's a graph of y equals the inverse sine of x. Which of these graphs is the derivative of this function? We can figure out the derivative by looking at the slopes of tangent lines. Here are a few tangent lines for the function y equals inverse sine of x. Notice that they're always positive in slope and that the slope is very large over here and very large over here. Which graph is always positive and gets very large as you get negative and positive? Right. The derivative is graph b. The inverse sine function is increasing everywhere, so its derivative is always positive, and the derivative is greatest near the edges of the function. Now let's work out exactly what the derivative of the inverse sine is. First off, what's an equivalent way to write that y equals the inverse sine of x? Whenever you see that y is equal to the inverse sine of x, you can always rewrite that as x is equal to the sine of y. Be careful, you can't always go the other way. Right. Saying that y equals the inverse sine of x is the same thing as saying that x equals the sine of y. Now try using implicit differentiation to take the derivative of both sides of this equation. What's the resulting equation you get? The derivative of x is just 1. What's the derivative of this? Well, there's a y here. We know how to take the derivative with respect to y of sine of y. The derivative with respect to y of sine of y is just cosine of y. But we want the derivative with respect to x. So we have to multiply this by a chain rule piece, dy dx. You can imagine that this y here can cancel with this y here to give you the derivative with respect to x. Nicely done. Let's see how you got that. On the right-hand side, the derivative of x is 1. On the left-hand side, you used the chain rule. First, you can find the derivative of the sine function, and that's cosine. So we have the cosine of y. 
and we can multiply that by the derivative of what's inside the sine function, which is y. The derivative of y is dy dx. So you found that if y equals the inverse sine of x, then the cosine of y times dy dx equals 1. We want to solve for dy dx, which is the derivative of the inverse sine. So to isolate dy dx on one side of this equation, let's divide both sides by the cosine of y. And that gives us dy dx equals 1 over the cosine of y. Using the fact that x equals the sine of y, can you find an equivalent way to write the cosine of y? Here's a triangle. And let's call this side x. We can call the hypotenuse 1. And that means that this angle here could be y. Why is that? Well, the sine of y is the opposite over the hypotenuse, which is x over 1, which is exactly what this equation says. Now, we want to find the cosine of y. To find the cosine of y, we need to know this length here. Can you find it using the Pythagorean theorem? Exactly. You used an identity that relates the sine and cosine functions. For any value of y, sine squared y plus cosine squared y equals 1. If we subtract sine squared y from both sides, and then take the square root of both sides, we see that cosine y equals the square root of 1 minus sine squared y. And we can simplify this expression here. Since sine y equals x, we can plug in an x over here so that cosine y equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. Let's substitute this expression in for the cosine y term in the denominator here. So when y equals the inverse sine of x, dy dx equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. In other words, the derivative of the inverse sine of x is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And that's exactly the derivative you found earlier. Here's the graph of the inverse sine. And sure enough, the derivative you picked out is the graph of the function 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. OK, so now that you've found the derivative of the inverse sine, try finding the derivative of the inverse cosine. You'll want to use the same techniques, like implicit differentiation, the chain rule, and at least one trig identity. Good luck. Let's call y the inverse cosine of x. Another way to write that is x is equal to the cosine of y. The next thing you want to do is take the derivative with respect to x of both sides. Why don't you give that a shot and ask for another hint if you get stuck. So far we've said that if y is equal to the inverse cosine of x, we can write that x is equal to the cosine of y. Taking the derivative of both sides gives us a 1 on the left, and the derivative with respect to x of the cosine of y is going to be minus sine of y times a chain rule piece, or dy dx. If we solve for dy dx, we find that dy dx is equal to minus 1, and if we divide by the sine of y, we get a sine of y in the denominator here. Now we want to write this expression without a y here. We only want an x. How can we do that? Ask for another hint if you're stuck. So far, we've said that the derivative of this thing here, which we've called y, is equal to minus 1 over the sine of y. We want to write that without a y on the right side. We want to write it in terms of x. So if this thing is y, then x is equal to the cosine of y. We can write this as x over 1. So if we have a triangle where one angle is y, and this is a right angle, the cosine of y 
the adjacent over the hypotenuse is x over 1, and that makes the second leg of the triangle the square root of 1 minus x squared. What's the sine of y? Well, the sine of y is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So this is minus 1 divided by the sine of y, which is the opposite, the square root of 1 minus x squared, over the hypotenuse, which is just 1. So this is the expression for the derivative of the inverse cosine. While implicit differentiation is useful for finding derivatives of complicated functions, you can also use it to solve a class of problems called related rates. Let's see an example. Suppose you're pouring pancake batter onto a frying pan at a constant rate. This is what you might see as you look down into the frying pan. Which property of the pancake would you also expect to increase at a constant rate? We're pouring stuff down at a constant rate, so we want to choose an answer that measures how much stuff is on the pan. Between the radius and the area, which one best measures how much stuff is on the pan? Right. The area will increase at a constant rate because it represents the total amount of batter in the pan. If we were to make a graph of how the pancake's area changes over time as we pour, it would look like this. The area is initially zero, and the area is increasing at a constant rate. Now let's see if we can figure out how quickly the pancake's radius is increasing. Which of the following functions looks like the most reasonable curve for how the pancake's radius changes over time? Initially, the radius is going to have to increase very quickly to accommodate the new area that you're pouring. But once the pancake is very big, the radius doesn't have to increase very much to add the same amount of area. These two shaded areas are roughly the same, but here the radius increased from this to that, which is a lot. Here it increased from this to that, which is much less. Which graph represents something that's increasing, but at a slower and slower rate? Exactly. The correct curve is C. The radius is increasing the fastest at the beginning, and slows down over time as the pancake gets bigger. Let's use implicit differentiation to see if we can prove this. First off, let's call the area of the pancake A, and the radius R. How can we relate these two variables? A pancake is a circle, so we want to find a relationship between the area of a circle and its radius. Do you know what that is? Right. Since the pancake is circular, its area is equal to pi r squared. We said the area is increasing at a constant rate. Let's suppose this rate is 5. For example, that could mean that the area is increasing at a rate of 5 square inches per second. So if the area is increasing at a rate of 5, how can we write down this fact mathematically? This graph here, we're saying, has a slope of 5. So the area is equal to 5 times t. If we take the derivative of that, we get that dA dt is equal to 5. So both of those are true. Exactly. If the area is increasing at a constant rate of 5, that means that dA dt equals 5. So if we know the rate at which the pancake's area is increasing, let's see if we can use that rate to find the rate at which the radius is increasing. We'll do that by starting with our equation that relates area and radius. 
and let's use implicit differentiation to take the derivative of both sides with respect to time t. Can you simplify this equation? The left hand side can be written as dA dt. On the right side, if we want to take the derivative with respect to t, we can rewrite it as the derivative with respect to r of pi r squared times a chain rule piece, dr divided by dt. What's this equal to? Great job! The left side becomes dA dt. And if we look at the right side, we're taking the derivative of pi times r squared. r changes over time, but pi is a constant, so we can pull it out of the derivative. That leaves us with pi times the derivative with respect to t of r squared. To find the derivative of r squared, you used the chain rule. First, the derivative of something squared is 2 times that something. So we have 2r, and we have to multiply that by the derivative of r, which is dr dt. So you found that the right side of this equation simplifies to pi times 2r dr dt. But this looks a little nicer if we swap the order of the 2 and the pi. So if a equals pi r squared, then dA dt equals 2 pi r dr dt. This is the equation that tells you how the rates are related. You can use dA dt, the rate at which the area is increasing, to find dr dt, the rate at which the radius is increasing. In this specific example of the pancake, we said that dA dt was equal to 5. If you plug this constant value for dA dt into the related rate equation you just found, can you solve for dr dt? If dA dt is equal to 5, then 5 is equal to 2 pi r times dr dt. Try getting dr dt all by itself and see if you can find the answer. Right, let's quickly see how you got that. First, you plugged in 5 for dA dt over here. To solve for dr dt, you divided both sides by 2 pi r. Great, let's just flip this equation around. So you found that dr dt equals 5 over 2 pi r. This result makes a lot of sense. When r is big, meaning the pancake is very large, having a large r in the denominator means this fraction will be small. And sure enough, the curve you picked out for radius versus time has a smaller instantaneous slope, or rate dr dt, for large values of r. And similarly, when r is small, this fraction will be bigger. So when the pancake is smaller, its radius is growing faster. And you can see that from the steeper tangent line over here when r is small. So sure enough, as the pancake gets bigger, the rate at which its radius increases gets smaller and smaller. With integral calculus, which you'll learn about later, we can actually find a precise formula for how the pancake's radius changes over time. In this example, where the area is increasing at a constant rate, it turns out that radius grows with the square root of t.